we're still in the series of pulling out, pulling back this blanket of blindness. And getting the truth. Because the world wants to paint this picture upon us. It wants to hide what's really going on. I know you'll be shocked about this. But the world lies. Yeah, I know that. That's a shocking revelation, isn't it? (laughs) It tells you that you have a right. You have a right to be angry. You have a right to hold grudges. That somehow you have a right to hold in the things that have offended you. Real or imagined. Are you familiar with the verse where Jesus says, the kingdom divided against itself cannot stand? I want you to look around the world. And I want you to contemplate what's going on. Women are uprising against men. There are men that's uprising against women. They call it sexism. They put pit blacks against whites. And Mexicans against whites. And they call it racism. And they pit the Muslims against everybody else. And it's racism. There's so many isms. And everybody's broken down into their own little branches. The gays feel like they're being discriminated against. The smokers, they feel like they're being discriminated against. I feel like I'm being discriminated against. (laughs) Okay. We've even had, we've even had commercials that say, don't hate me because I'm beautiful. And I can understand that. (laughs) Okay, I'll repent of that later. Anyway, everything's all broken down into these different groups. Because a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. But they're not trying to divide the kingdom of the world. They're trying to divide the kingdom of the cross. Let me say that again. They're not trying to divide the kingdom of the world. They're trying to divide the kingdom of the cross. They're doing this this with groups that are inside the church, that are outside the church. The ones that are outside the church attack the church as though it is an entity that is performing all the racism. All the sexism. Every kind of ism you could think of. We find it. We look inside the church and we see men that are trying to keep women down. And we see women that are trying to put everybody else down so they can elevate themselves. All inside the church. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6.
We're going to do verse 14 and 15. Because I need to I need to let you understand something. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. <clears throat> you don't have a right to hold grudges. Let me repeat that. You do not have a right to hold grudges. Because you have done more wrong to God than anyone will ever do to you here. You have fallen far short before God than people have fallen short before you. We're going to see that in the next place we go. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not, if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You see, the trick is to building you up with a little pride. The trick is to get you alone in your own little group where you think you've been wrong. You know what happens when somebody starts looking for racism? Do you? It says if you seek it, you shall find it. You'll find it. It doesn't matter if it's even real. Sometimes it's just in your head. People look at you a certain way and they don't mean anything by it, but you take it a certain way. Sometimes it is real. A lot of times it can be real. A lot of times... Your husband can offend you. Yeah, no, I see you shaking your head. Your husband can offend you real good. And you can hold that in. And hold that against him. And break up and destroy your marriage in the process. And not even realize that in doing so, You're condemning your soul. Think about that. Because we see a lot of people right now in the streets hollering racist this way, racist that way, and not even realizing they're condemning their own soul. They think they have a right to do it because they've been offended. But the Bible says if you do not forgive, you cannot be forgiven. Let me repeat that. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, God will not forgive you yours. Turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 23. Jesus is telling a parable here. It says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take count of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. That's a lot. Okay? 10,000 talents. A talent, that's about 100 pounds. 10,000 pounds. 10,100 pounds. He's talking about 100,000 pounds here. 
um, for but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded to him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. And the, the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay all. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. There's a lot of people come into church and they do this. God convicts them of their sin. They come down to the altar and they bow down and then they get up and they lift their hands and they repeat, Lord God, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. And they walk through the sinner's prayer. And the tears of conviction are flowing down their face. And they leave free by God of their debt. But as soon as they leave the door, they do what this servant did. But the same servant, verse 28, went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. He owed him a dollar. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Repeated exactly his own words. And he would not, though. He would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredest of me. Should not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth and delivered him into the, unto the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall the he my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. See, they leave forgiven, they go out, and then they get offended. And they pull up the big board. And they ride upon it on their side. This is what was done unto me. This is what was owed. And I have a right to keep this on my ledger. On the right side. They never bother to look back upon the left. Where God has forgiven them. Because that ledger goes on continually. And as they write it up here, the ledger that was clear reappears. They damn themselves to hell because of a lack of forgiveness. They think in the pride of their heart, of their heart they have a right to this. I have a right to this. No, you do not. You are bought with a price. You are not your own. Women look at men and they say, they're keeping me down. And I'm against them for that. They don't pay me equal. And I have a right to that. And I will put that on my ledger. Because I'm a woman and they've went against women. 
And they, you can do that against blacks. And you can do that against the Japanese during World War II. You can do that against the Jews. You can do that against this, against this, against this. There's so many isms and so many fractures and so many breaking. But yet when Jesus hung on the cross, they came up to break His bone. And they found Him already dead. And so they broke it on His bones. Because it was not right for God's body to be broken. But yet here we are, breaking it, dividing it, separating it up. These are the lies of the world. We have preachers in pulpits that are afraid to preach against it. They are even afraid to address it. Because people have become so intense about that right side of the ledger. We ought to be pointing out the left side of the ledger. The one that has God's tally on it. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. It says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger. Verse 31. We'll start at verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. I'm going to stop right there. This is what happens to your life when you let the isms in. When you start keeping track and putting things on your ledger. Instead of peace, you get bitterness because you feel like you've been wrong instead of feeling like you've been forgiven. You get angry and wrath. You, want to, you, you start taking it out. Look out on the streets. Watch them burning the cars. Watch them screaming at people and beating people that just pass by. They raise a clamor, loud yelling, loud screaming, rioting, speaking evil, speaking hate, wanting to destroy, wanting to pay back for the evil on the right side of the ledger. It's malice. It's evil. This is what grows up in your life. And it seeps out into your children. You see women that embrace the hatred of men. But they go out and they have children, and they feed it into the they feed it into their kids. Sometimes they're married and they get angry with their husbands and they break off from them, and they superimpose that anger they have for the husband on all mankind. And they dig the roots right into their kids. And they sink that poison right into the children to be passed down a spirit 
to be passed down from one child to the next child, from generation to generation, causing divisions in the church where there should be love, where there should be holiness, where there should be unity. There is none. He says, put this away from you. In verse 32, he says, And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. What does a humble, forgiving heart look like? We've seen in 31 what a prideful heart looks like like a heart that embraces that right side of the ledger that holds everything that is done wrong against them, that embraces the divisions and says, I have to be special. I have to be over here separated from everybody else so everybody else can see me, so that everybody else can know that I'm different and I'm special. So that I stand out. So I can show how I'm being mistreated. Bitterness. Wrath. Anger. Clamor. And evil speaking. Be put away from you with all malice. Do it with an anger. Get that stuff out of your heart, out of your life. A forgiven heart does not puff itself up. Turn with me to Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 4. Chapter 13, 1 Corinthians. This is a very common verse. We read it a lot. Charity, which is love. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, love never fails. A heart of peace. A heart that's not focused on itself, but is focused on God and God's touch, God's move on everyone else. It suffereth long because it cares about others. It's kind to others. It doesn't envy what anybody else has because it has its enough in Christ. It has its fulfillment and its fullness in God and its relationship with God. It doesn't puff up. It stays humble because it realizes its left side of the ledger is very long. And all the stuff on the right side, it's not worth going to hell for. All the stuff on the right side, it pales in comparison to what's owed on the left. It does not behave itself unseemly. Wow. 
We see that a lot. We have people going around doing, they call it the punch game, the knockout game. They just go over and just hit somebody who's not paying any attention. Sucker punch them. Try to knock them out. They have guys running over, going over to old women, punching them in the face. Seek it not her own. <clears throat> Is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. See, that's the opposite of an ism. That's the opposite of, I have rights. That is, I gave up my rights at the cross. I gave up my, my rights at the cross. Let God justify me in everything. If He feels I need revenge, avenged, He'll do it because He's my Father. But I'm just going to love. I'm going to pray for those that despitefully use me. I'm going to pray that God reaches into the heart and changes that person that dislikes me for no reason. I'm going to seek out in love for Him and everyone I come in contact with. He doesn't rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in truth. It beareth all things because its master beareth all things. He bore all things. It believeth all things and hopeth all things. It endureth all things because it walks in faith, not in pride. All these things that the world tells you, you have a right. You have an obligation to get upset about. God says, if you have them in your life, you're on your way to hell. Because if you can't forgive men their trespasses, Neither will I forgive you yours. Let me repeat that. If you can't forgive men their trespasses, neither will I forgive yours. We don't have a place in the church for isms and divisions. I've been in some churches where we have classisms where the wealthy sit in one area and the poor sit in one area and everybody that's in the middle sits everywhere else. God forbid. God forbid. If God is not a respecter of person, And why are you? We have little cliques that set up. We got the holiness click over here that says amen and shouts while the preacher's preaching. We got the little group over here that screams and giggles and dances. We got a group up here who folds their arms and looks at everybody cross eyed. I'm telling you right now, God's not a respecter of persons. It takes those people that dance, it takes those people that yell. Sometimes it takes those people that frown, to keep the preacher straight. 
Sometimes it takes the little old ladies who have more prayer behind them than everybody else in the church. Because they don't do it because they want to. They pray because they have to. They ain't got a choice but to reach God every day. Hallelujah. The church ain't got a place for division. But even going smaller than the church, as an individual, you don't have a place for division. You don't get to say, I'm black. You don't get to say, I'm white. According to my Bible, there is no such thing as a Greek, as a Roman, or a Jew. There's just Christian. God's not a respective person. There's no such thing as male or female. There's just God's. When you allow these things to get into your life, you destroy your walk. You destroy your relationship. And what's more, you destroy your soul. Today we're going to pull them back. The lies of the world that's been placed upon us. See, you don't have to be special to the world. If you seek out the world's adoration, you already have your reward with whatever you get. God says don't seek the adoration of everybody else. Stop posting on Facebook to get everybody to go, Stop telling everybody what you eat because nobody cares. It doesn't matter if you're a rock star. It doesn't matter if you're an actress or a model. It doesn't matter if you're the world's most in-depth Bible student. And you just want to share your wisdom with the world. My wife's looking at me now. That's all right. Doesn't matter. If you ain't pressed God, if that ain't the goal of your life, is if that isn't the drive of your life to get His approval, then you have nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's not about isms. It's about, oh God, Master, do you see me today? Can you Talk to me today. Can you be with me today? Can you bless me today? Can you love me today? Am I yours? Am I pleasing to you? Oh God, you're the focus of my life. Do I meet your approval? Are you happy with me, Lord?
Is this left side of the ledger, is it clear? Because I've taken great pains to wipe off everything on the right side. It's just chalk dust, Lord. And if I could, I'd wipe that off. If you get approval from God, it's deeper than what man's approval is. Man's approval is superficial and fleeting. God's approval gets right down into the soul where you need it. It gets right down into the heart. Right down into the crux of your life. It fills it. It expands it. It applies pressure to it. It fills it completely up. Don't trade that filling. F-I-L-L-I-N-G. Don't trade that person of God. That relationship. For anything on that right side. Don't do it. Don't let it. Don't let it fester there. Don't let it sit there. Because it will take you and your soul straight to hell. And there ain't nothing anybody's done to you if it's destroying your family, if it's killing your children. Nothing they've done. Is worth going to hell for them. For just so you can keep it on that right side of the ledger. Clean it off. Get rid of your grudges. Get rid of your supposed things that you have a right to keep. And let God clean you. And fill you with peace once again. The church has no place for isms. But hell does. Think about it. This altar's open. In Jesus' name. Amen.